Today on The Real Story, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill has made her decision. She will not seek a fourth term in office. This as Connecticut considers efforts to expand voter access in the state. We'll reflect on her more than 30 years of public service and talk about what's next for her and the state. Denise Merrill is our first guest this morning. And then it's official. Recreational pot will soon be legal in our state. So what does that mean for you? How will this new industry look? Bill proponent State Senator Gary Winfield helps break down the legislation for us. And Republican leader State Senator Kevin Kelly joins us to explain the pain points for those who are against the bill. It's all today on The Real Story. And thanks for joining us on The Real Story. I'm Jen Bernstein. A big announcement from Secretary of the State Denise Merrill this week. She let us know she will not be seeking a fourth term in office. That's after 30 years of public service. She first came onto the political scene in 1991, seeking a seat on the Mansfield School Board, then serving several terms in the Connecticut House, representing Mansfield and Chaplin. She was a majority leader at one point, then winning a statewide campaign for one of the coveted constitutional offices as Secretary of the State, holding that seat since 2011. While in office, she's fought to expand voter access, to modernize our election system, adding in ever-changing technology, such as being able to register to vote through an app. She also sat in a very visible position in the last two presidential election cycles where the security of our voting system was brought into question. A frequent guest of The Real Story, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, joining us now to talk about her decision and what's next. Good morning to you. Good morning, Jen. <laughs> All right, so... Why did you decide the time is now? Oh, the time feels absolutely right to me. Uh, I've been thinking about it for a while. And if you're not going to run uh, in the next election, I think the earlier you let people know, the better, uh, because that gives other people a chance to uh, sign on, try it out. What, you know, if somebody wants to form a committee and run for this office, it gives them plenty of time to have an election and plenty of time for, to, to have the voters get that choice. So it felt right to me. Uh, I've accomplished almost everything I ever wanted wanted to accomplish in this office. And I feel like these are borrowed offices. I don't think people should stay forever. Uh, I stayed much longer than I ever thought I would already um, in both my state rep role uh, from Mansfield, where we worked on UConn issues, and many other things. And then on, I've been in this office. By the time I finish my term, it'll be 12 years. And that's a long time. So it feels very right to me. I saw your Twitter feed when you were making your announcement or after you made your in-person announcement and you had this story about a letter that you had written in the beginning of your career. I thought it was really fascinating. Tell our viewers about it. Well, when I was a new legislator, I got a fellowship uh, from a group in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so along with uh, new legislators, and that was their target audience, uh, they wanted to kind of, I guess, initiate us. Um, we went to Washington for a week. And at that uh, meeting, they asked us to write our political epitaph. It was a startling idea. So rather than asking you where you're starting, they wanted to know where you thought you'd want to end up in politics, in political life. What would you like to be that, that final place where you would feel you had done what you wanted to do. Uh, so, of course, a lot of people, uh, I have to say mostly the men legislators, and there were a lot of them then, uh, were saying things like, I want to be U.S. Senator, I want to be President of the United States. So uh, they told us to write down what our answer was, seal it up, and don't look at it for at least 10 years, which, of course, I did. I pretty much forgot about it, threw it in a drawer somewhere. I came across it much later on, opened it up, and what it said was, I would like to end up as the Connecticut Secretary of the State. <laughs> and that's, that's a true funny. story. <laughs> so why Secretary of the State? What was it about the office that you dreamt about even when you were a new legislator? Well, those were my issues. I came in um, as an educator uh, and a lawyer, and I wanted to um, teach about the law. That's what I had been doing. I had a little project. I worked with teachers in schools about law education and civic education. So um, I was actually had a little nonprofit and worked a lot with Pauline Kieser, who was then the Secretary of the State. So I was very familiar with the office. And I really thought that was the place where you could make a difference on issues 
that mattered uh, to me, at least, electoral issues and issues of how do we get people engaged, how do we get people voting, especially young people. So that's that's why it was a big thing to me. We touched on some of your accomplishments in office, some of the issues that you were passionate about. What would you say is your proudest achievement? Oh, it has to be uh, the progress we've made on access to the ballot in Connecticut. Uh, you know, when I came into office just 10 years ago, 11 now, um, we still had to register on paper in our local offices. Since that time, we've put in all kinds of online services. It's easier than ever to register. It's easier than ever to vote in Connecticut. Have we still got some ways to go? Yes, we do. And that's why I'm going to continue to work. Uh, I have another year and a half in my term to get these constitutional amendments passed to, so that we'll have early voting. In other words, more days of voting in Connecticut, like 40 other states already have, and, uh, and more access to absentee ballots, which really came up during the last election. So yeah. there's work to be done. Uh, but those are my, yes, those are my proudest moments. Uh, both of the bills that you were just talking about made uh, you know their presence known this past session. Early voting did get through both chambers. That's going to be on the 2022 ballot as a constitutional amendment, which means you at home are going to have a chance to weigh in on whether that becomes law or not, whether you'll be able to vote early, right? Uh, what, are, what are the parameters for people who are curious? How early are we talking about allowing people to come and vote? Well, it'll probably be at least several days. Uh, that will have to all be worked out by the legislature once it's actually passed the constitutional muster. We have to get the restrictive language out of the Constitution. And then the legislature will decide after, I'm sure, quite a debate uh, how many days we want to do it, you know, who's going to do it, where we're going to do it. Uh, there's lots of examples to look at across the country. So uh, that'll be determined at the time it passes on the ballot. And I think it will. There's a lot of people that want these measures. So um, I'm hoping that it will pass in 2022. So it will just be a simple question. Voters will weigh in and then legislators will debate on the specifics of early voting, correct? Exactly, exactly. Let's talk about absentee voting. That did not pass through. Um, and I, I know I was reading the rules on when the earliest absentee voting could be put on the ballot because it's again, it's a constitutional amendment. So the voters are going to have to weigh in, but it is complicated. Well, it was for early voting too, but another legislature is going to have to vote on this, right? Because it didn't make it through both chambers. So then you need a new legislature and needs to vote pass through both those chambers by a certain amount before it can make it on. So the earliest it can make it on is 2024? Yeah, it's very frustrating. It's a long haul. It did make it through both chambers, but it needed to make it by 75%. And that's a it was. big bump. It did pass by 75% in the Senate, but not in the House. So it has to go back to the legislature and then to the voters. Yeah, as you know, there were lawmakers that weren't on board with uh, absentee voting. There were some of them. And there was the question that was brought up of security. Tell us this COVID pandemic has changed so much. Absentee ballot voting was allowed this last year here in Connecticut. How did you think it went? Were there security concerns? Oh, there are always security concerns these days. I'm not sure why, because we have multiple checks and balances in place, as most people know if you've been voting for a long time. It's just the difference was in Connecticut, not, not very many people ever used absentee ballots. Usually we have about 4% of the population comes in with an absentee ballot. Uh, this time it was 35%, and that was the challenge for the local uh, officials to be able to process that many ballots. And that's because there are so many checks and balances. You have to apply for an absentee ballot. Then you have to get it in the mail. You have to sign your name that you know you are the person on that ballot. Then they send you a ballot in the mail. Then you either drop it off in one of the ballot boxes or and, and then it goes into the clerk's office. But it's also in a double envelope sealed by both so that no one can see your name, it preserves the anonymity. And then those are all kept until election day and sorted at that time. So there's many, many people involved and it's very complicated and that made it harder. But we had the most successful election I can remember 
Uh, more people voted, more people registered to vote, and particularly interesting to me, more young people registered to vote and voted. So it was, in my mind, a very successful election in Connecticut, despite the enormous challenge of getting all this through the process. There are people that are concerned about the voter rolls, and they feel like Connecticut's voter rolls aren't necessarily as updated as they could be. What's your message to them? Is there truth in that? Uh, you know what? Connecticut's voter rolls are more accurate than almost any other voting rolls, certainly in New England area. You know, rolls are always changing every single day. It's very difficult to keep them absolutely up to date, mostly because the voters are the ones that are supposed to update their records. We're a lot better than we used to be because people now can update their records at the DMV. That has helped tremendously. But you're always going to have a lot of mobility. People move. Kids go off to college, whatever it is. But um, they should not be concerned about that because, you know, voters come in to vote. It's not like we sent applications for absentee ballots, much like you get an application for a credit card in the mail. It doesn't mean you're getting a credit card. And it doesn't mean you're getting an absentee ballot unless you apply and are on the list. So I think this has been blown very far out of proportion, but I understand it. You know, people were getting applications that had, had other names on uh, on there that pe for people who had moved or maybe children who had moved on. So uh, we do better every year. Uh, it's all maintained at the local level. My office has nothing to do with actually uh, keeping the list. But there's going to be better and better ways to do that in the future. I remember that when people were getting those applications and they were concerned. But you're saying there are checks and balances in place if someone did apply uh, to be able to use that absentee ballot. You feel like it's strong enough where we could eventually do this system. So you had touched on this uh, just a, a bit ago during our discussion, how you wanted to allow enough time for someone who wants the Position to prepare, to test the waters, to take a look. What are you hoping for for your successor? What do you want the person who will be in your seat to do and accomplish? This has become an enormously important job uh, over the last couple of years, and it's no mystery why. Uh, there are more and more people who don't trust our elections, which is extremely delicate and very bad for democracy, honestly. I never thought I'd see it in our country, but that's where we are. So I hope it's someone who can get that trust, maintain our system as it is at least, and if not better, uh, and continue down this path of giving more and more access to people who want to vote. We should enable them to vote easily if they can and make it as pleasant an experience as possible because it's their right to vote. Uh, so I hope people continue those policies uh, I, I can't imagine they wouldn't. I think Connecticut's in a very good place right now, which is one of the reasons I feel okay about leaving at this stage, despite the fact that it is an enormous conversation nationally, uh, but not so much in Connecticut, because I think we're in a good place. So what is next for you? You mentioned that you're not going to, you know, totally disappear. You're going to still push efforts to increase voter access in our state. What does that mean? Does that mean lobbying? Does that mean participating in advocacy groups? What does it mean? Uh, I think it means more doing more at the national level, honestly, uh, trying to have, participate in some of the conversations going on in places like Arizona, Michigan, uh, even Georgia. Uh, I have been members of the National Association of Secretaries of State, which is a bipartisan organization, as well as a Democratic Secretaries of State organization. And everyone's trying to figure out how can we make people understand the election process. So I would hope to be part of some of that. I'm also very interested still in civic education. I still think it is the most important thing we can do is to educate the public. There's so much misinformation, disinformation, and downright lies on the internet about elections. And there has to be something we can do to make sure that the public is more educated about how the system actually works, and how local it really is, and how they can we can regain their trust. Denise Merrill, the Secretary of the State, you're going to come back on the program because you still have a year and a half, right? You said in your position, so this is not goodbye, but we appreciate you coming on the program and reflecting on your time in office and uh, some of the issues that you are passionate about. Please continue to keep us updated. Thank you, Jen. Nice to be here.
All right, coming up on The Real Story, in just days, pot will be legal here in Connecticut. That's after years and years of debate. We're going to break down the bill with one of the champions of the bill here, State Senator Gary Winfield, plus GOP leader State Senator Kevin Kelly is going to join us to walk us through the concerns around the legislation for those who don't support it. The Real Story continues after this.